Hi, and welcome to another video of 10 Ideas 50 Years. This is a 10, I guess, video series on ideas that I think that you should know uh, based on the past 50 years, so that if you ever, for example, got stuck in a time machine, went back 50 years ago, these would be the 10 ideas to really bring back uh, if, if you had to, had to pick. And uh, so th this is going to be a little bit different than the previous videos. Uh, in that it's actually an empirical study. And so, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a lab full of people to try this with, but I encourage you to try to reproduce this and uh, you know, see if the, uh, the, the numbers actually stick. And so, this is break, the uh, genesis of popular but erroneous psycho psychodiagnostic observations. by one uh, Lauren J. Chapman and uh, Jean P. Chapman at the University of Wisconsin uh, back in 1967. Uh, this was published in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology, uh, volume 72, as it were. Uh, and the idea here is that uh, they were looking at uh, a particular type of test. Uh, there was a couple of tests that dated to about the maybe two, somewhere between the 20s and the 40s uh, that were shown to be completely invalid uh, for di or diagnosing uh, mental disorders or, or, or mental afflictions uh, and that by 1967 they were clearly shown to be complete hocus. Uh, there was no uh, scientific basis for it at all. It was just a more or less big mistake. However, even by this point in the 60s, uh, uh, I guess psych, your, your psych nurses and your, uh, what they call uh, diagnostic psychodiagnosticians, psycho there's a word you can uh, chew on for a while, uh, were tended to still believe in these particular tests and the validity thereof, uh, regardless of whether or not they should have known better. Um, and so they, they kind of looked at these particular tests. And so what exactly were they looking at? So the first one was the Rosarch, or Rosarch, I'm pronouncing that right. some kind of like an ink blot, and uh, people would then see things in the ink blot and then report, depending on what they saw or depending on what they drew, uh, or, or, or depending on what they saw in the, the blot, uh, you could say something about them. And there may be cases where for that particular test you can you know, get some information out of it, but it's kind of like a lie detector test in that uh, the amount of information you can get out of it is fairly limited and it's not exactly uh, for normal people you'll you'll get a wide enough range uh, of results that chances are you're, you're just going to read a lot into it uh, and the same thing for this other test called the draw a person test which is basically that you were if you would instruct the person who is supposedly crazy to draw a person And then depending on how they drew that person and what detail they put where, you would supposedly be able to say something about that person's mental state. And so, for example, the fact that I didn't put eyes on my little stick figure may say something about me that I'm maybe perfectly sane. I don't know. Um, but regardless of what the, the initial um, uh, viewpoints of what was assigned to what, or what symptoms were assigned to what characteristics of the picture, a uh, systematic uh, study was done uh, before this study to show more or less conclusively that there was nothing to it and that people had read into it, uh, all of these characteristics and that this was more or less just a mistake on the line of phrenology. 
by the study of bumps on your head to determine whether or not your you know, head actually works properly. Uh, and so the, the question was, why did still people still believe it? And why did it kind of persist as a test that uh, was still being used in the field to that day? And hopefully not to this day, but you will never know. And so the first thing they noticed is that it was a fairly uh, kind of a, a reliable error in, in that if you went to your typical you know, psych ward or your you know, psych clinic, you would find people who would believe this uh, and the, the theory behind it, and you would tell them that you know that this isn't true. You, you could show them the, the studies against it, and they would probably just forget about it after a couple of weeks and go back to testing the same way. Uh, it wasn't something that was very important, but it was still part of their toolkit that they were using. And so the, the, the question of how do we get this out of the toolkit and replace it with something more scientifically valid was kind of an open one at the time. And so the, they kind of viewed it in terms of uh, the, the... They figured that there was experts in the field who had been using it for a long time, and people who were kind of working underneath them, who were taking guidance from them, kind of following along and assuming it was valid because their you know, boss or their uh, mentor or whatever um, had, had used it and had treated it as valid, so it obviously must be valid, right? Uh, and the other, I, I guess, view was that it wasn't so much that the uh, nature of the evidence itself, but that it, it could possibly be uh, because we're, we're dealing with a visual text, uh, there's a lot of visual uh, illusions. And they, um, I guess, pointed out one particular illusion. Even just kind of drawing out these three lines, putting arrows on them, you know, it, the middle one kind of looks longer. I, I may not have drawn it quite well enough, but you can certainly find GIF images online with the same effect. Where basically, because of the way your visual processing system works, you look at a picture like this, you can't help but see something. Uh, in this case, a line that's longer than the others, um, if I've done that correctly. And so they were kind of viewing. The, the, the viewing of details within a, a picture in the same kind of light, in that there's ways we perceive humans to be, uh, and we, we may just assume that because we, you know, our visual system deals with that in a certain way, that, uh, you know, that that's actually, you know, if there's a person with, you know, daddy issues or something like that, that they'll, you know, draw a person in a certain way. And so that, that is something that they were trying to find. So uh, they, they conducted a series of about six experiments to try to recreate the theory itself. And so not necessarily to validate the theory, but to show if you threw a whole bunch of undergrad students at the data and had them come up with an idea or come up with a theory based around the concept, what correlate or what features would be correlated with what particular pictures or what particular parts of pictures and so on. And so they would come up with a series of pictures. Uh, they would then come up with a series of statements like that's a And so on and so forth. Ba basically, uh, scientific enough, they may not have used these exact ones, but you get the idea. Where they, they basically assign properties and assign 
uh, characteristics to a picture or a, an aspect of a picture, and vice versa. And so you would then look through, or the, the, the idea of the experiment would be that they would present random pairings of this picture with words. And then the students or, or the, the subjects of the experiments would then have to piece together a, a, what they would feel to be a coherent picture uh, with the expectation that if it was purely by chance that people formed this coherent picture, then a large number of these incoherent, coherent pictures should balance each other out. And there shouldn't actually be any patterns on who assigns what to what word, or who assigns what picture to what word and vice versa. And they went through a lot of uh, work to try to kind of reduce the, or to, to make these pictures as realistic as possible. They got uh, 35 pictures from actual psychotics, or what they would call to be psychotics, and 10 from, quote, non-psychotics. Uh, they were given to uh, the intro to psych uh, undergrad students uh, and ver kind of filtered their students to make sure that nobody had heard of this particular type of test uh, coming into it. And so their hypothesis was that the students would come up with not only cons consistent pictures compared to each other based on actual random pairings of symptoms and pictures, uh, but that the symptom uh, picture correlated groups would uh, align with what professionals in the field were actually coming up with. And so, again, this is not the, 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 the professionals in the field should know better. They should know if there was actually a correlation between googly eyes and aggressive behavior that, you know, if you saw a picture with googly eyes, you know, you would assign aggressive behavior to it. Uh, likewise, uh, if the people who really don't know what they're doing assign, you know, this, this feature to this you know, picture um, based on a perceived pairing of words, uh, alone, not not even of, of their own imagina uh, uh, imagination, but actual, you know, pairing of you know, flashcard with picture, uh, then you know something is definitely broken and something is definitely wrong. Uh, in addition to that, and we'll get into this particular subset of the experiment in a bit, uh, but they did put a kind of null hypothesis test where they actually did have a correlation, and just to see if anyone would catch it. We'll get into the result of that. Uh, so the first experiment was they were given uh, pictures with descriptions uh, to prime them. Uh, they were given uh, descriptions and picture descriptions uh, about the, the, the aspects of the picture, like for example, you know, if it's specific to the eyes, you know, they'll they'll assign, they'll have like a little arrow pointing to the eye or something with a specific um, you know, symptom relating to that particular feature. And then they were also given uh, pictures to add or to add descriptions to. And so they're they're basically given uh, training, you know, given a. a an introduction to the theory, not necessarily any of the correlations, but just sort of a description that there are correlations to find. Uh, then they're given a whole bunch of examples to train them, and then they're given uh, kind of blank ones to fill in the, the dots. And the result of those the hi their hypothesis was valid, i.e. Uh, there was a clumping of actual results. Uh, people tended to have preconceptions of what uh, people who drew things, who drew stick figures, should be like, even if those were completely just paired with random words. And in addition to that, but those preconceptions just happened to be the same preconceptions that professionals in the field had. Uh, 
there was seven there there were seven associated groups uh, that the students came up with and eight that the professionals came up with. Uh, and so this is a, a fairly close match to uh, uh, probability against odds uh, of 0.01 that they're coming up with the same uh, results even if they're being primed with random data rather than good data. So, uh, this is a systematic uh, bias in how the professionals are, are dealing with things, and so that's worthy of notice. An example given is, quote, broad-shouldered muscular figures more often correlate with the symptom of he is worried about how manly he is uh, than for any of the other six symptoms. Uh, and both groups reported drawings with atypical eyes were more often symptoms of suspicion and uh, being suspicion, suspicious of other people uh, than any other symptom. And so this is fed, regardless of what you're fed, you'll kind of believe this by default. They call this the associated bias. In addition to measuring whether or not they got the, um, I guess, aspects of the pictures uh, wrong, they, they narrowed it down to even parts of the picture's body. So the eyes, the muscles, the hair, the you know, head, uh, all of these things showed clumping and showed preconceptions, and all of these things matched the preconceptions of the experts. Also notable is that the uh, preconceptions of the psych nurses uh, was stronger uh, than the preconceptions of the, I guess, nudes um, and the students. So in other words, the longer, the more experience you've had uh, and the more evidence you've actually seen regarding these pictures, the less likely you were to know whether or not uh, they were actually accurate. Uh, the evidence uh, they found, they would argue that it, the, um, the, the, this particular bias uh, is not the only reason that the draw person uh, test is invalid. Uh, it is just a substantial one. Um, and that the fact that this particular experiment turned out the way that it did was not altogether, it's, uh, I guess, um, not altogether surprising based on what they knew at the time. So the other, I guess, five experiments were basically uh, changes on that theme. So for example, the second experiment, they, they did the, the same experiment uh, with the exception that instead of telling the students that they were looking for uh, a, a, you know, a pattern or a correlation, um, each of the three days that they, they came in for um, this experiment, they only gave a brief uh, introduction at the beginning and then had them kind of do the work, uh, not necessarily in a self-directed way, but uh, in a closer to um, real life clinical uh, way in that they're actually given the, the assignment to do um, and they, they just kind of have to do it without necessarily being, you know, spoon-fed the, the, the theory uh, quite as much. And the result was, uh, given three groups uh, that kind of had this amount of introduction priming material uh, varied, that there was no effect. Uh, certainly anything um, above 5%, um, and that the, if there was anything to do with 
uh, priming, uh, causing the problem of people finding correlations where there were none. Uh, it was certainly not at a um, very high rate, and it didn't seem to account for the massive systematic error that they were seeing. Uh, the next, uh, the, the third, uh, I guess, experiment was that uh, they specifically looked from the direction of symptom the picture. And so they were given symptoms to match two pictures and to match two parts of pictures that were notable, uh, you know, parts of the body uh, and that, again, this turned out to have the exact same results with the exact same clumps uh, as the other experiments, as well as the actual professional clinicians in the field. So the fourth experiment, uh, again, on this uh, the same direction, uh, they figured, okay, well, perhaps people are just getting lazy and that they're not really paying attention to the correlations and they're just, for whatever reason, not putting themselves into it. And so they're, they're not really interested in learning the material. And so if you're given a whole bunch of tr you know, training flashcards uh, with associated uh, words and symptoms to them, maybe you're not actually paying attention to them. And so, uh, first of all, nobody complained about a lack of time, but they were worried that perhaps people, you know, for whatever reason, weren't taking the time to do it. And so they designed two further experiments to take that factor hopefully out of it, uh, which was one, uh, they uh, did, first of all, they, they introduced, uh, as we kind of mentioned before, um, the, uh, the spurious correlation, where they actually put a correlation in there to find. Uh, with the specific intent that it was going to be one of the correlations that was not detected by default. And so that uh, particular correlation was not picked up on, even if it was, uh, even if the evidence for it was overwhelming. And so uh, it was not picked up to a probability against odds of 0.02. So on top of that, there was another task, another experiment, uh, experiment five, where the, the the question of motivation and incentives was was kind of put up for grabs. So the students were actually paid to do and to actually be the most accurate. And so a twenty dollar reward, which is a lot of money in 1967, was offered. And uh, I don't know how much Bitcoin that would be uh, equivalent to of today, but uh, maybe even up to ten to twenty. And uh, so, you know, at, at the time, uh, they were still, um, you know, given per picture. Uh, they were still clumped per picture per group, and uh, they were, they were also uh, told that they were uh, only allowed to, to look at each picture or each initial pairing once and that if they put it down, uh, they, they couldn't pick it up again, so that forced them to pay attention when they had the chance. As well, uh, they were given all the time they needed to actually learn the material, and expli explicitly to told so. Uh, the result, again, was no difference. Uh, the, the clumps were the same. Uh, the $20 uh, was viewed that it you, you couldn't attribute this to a lack of motivation, a lack of stimulus materials, or a lack of uh, time. So at this point, they're starting to kind of think out of, outside of the box. They're starting to call into question the, the basic properties of the, the, the lab environment where they're, where they're doing this test, where they start, instead of, you know, just giving uh, you know, a single piece of paper to, to fill out and, you know, maybe you know, a single deck of flashcards. You get a whole stack of empty cards with which to write on. You can, you know, you get scrap paper, you get pencils, you get, you know, a $20 motivation bonus by default. You get, um, 
you, you can you're instructed on how to shuffle and arrange the cards so that you can kind of do your own probability testing of the data itself. Um, you can, you know, the, the subjects were given, you know, told how to count the piles, to, to spread the piles out, and that they could spread the piles out, that they could look at the priming material as long as they wanted, put it down, do anything they wanted with it. Um, and all of this, I mean, first of all, most people didn't go through anywhere near enough work to actually uh, realize the kind of non-correlation they were dealing with. Uh, but even in the, the, of the people who did uh, go through some effort, um, there was still a correlation, and it was still there, although it was slightly less. Uh, so probability against odds of 0.05 instead of 0.01. Uh, and the correlation itself tended to be in the 30% correlated rather than 52% correlated realm. So it was, it was a little bit better if you had the answer kind of staring in front of you where you actually had to work with your hands in order to, to prove to yourself that it was there. Um, but even so, quote, the most striking aspect of the findings is the resistance of the error to the influence of reality. I, even when people had the answer staring at them right in front of them with piles of paper that are you know, distributed in a this frequency distribution, they still didn't see it. Uh, and that the only explanation at this point was that what it, the subjects expected to see before they saw it was the only real conclusion of, of what associations were there. Uh, and so at this point they started looking at how this compared to the real, at, at least in the, in the 1960s, uh, the real clinical practice and how people had to deal with symptoms and, uh, I guess, visible things associated with those symptoms. And so the first problem is that these experiments were done over a series of days, um, but the actual, um, I guess, experiment, experiment itself uh, tended to actually only, you know, be over a, maybe a couple of hours. So the, the correlations that go over many days uh, would simply not be simulated, and so these correlations, correlations in the in the you know in the field, would be much much more difficult to find uh, than these kind of easier ones, or or, or respectively, uh, much more difficult to not find and to notice that you're actually just following it as a, a chimera in practice. Uh, the other thing is that the number of symptoms uh, is not necessarily anywhere as few as the ones they were dealing with. They only dealt with maybe a couple dozen uh, at most, whereas uh, the nurses in the field would tend to ha have to actually go through you know, a great deal many uh, in order to, uh, I guess, associate something with a particular symptom. Uh, it the, the ability to see a correlation would be much greater when there's a lot of other um, data to kind of go through. The uh, experiment showed that the it wasn't just that, or, or rather, in the, in the field, it would not just be that you're dealing with spurious correlations, but whether or not to see the symptoms themselves. And so, if there's a person who's paranoid uh, and a lot of other things, you may not necessarily see the fact that they're paranoid. So it would be doubly hard to find whether that paranoia is correlated with something, for example, that they drew. Uh, and likewise, you may be overly focused on their paranoia at the expense of other things where correlations may actually be. Uh, another, uh, I, I guess, way that the, the in the field practice would be worse than this experiment would be that in this experiment, no communication was allowed between people that they were testing. And so if people came to their own conclusions, and it just so happened that it more or less matched the conclusions of their peers, uh, they could not validate each other's opinion. Uh, they called the a tendency of people to do this, quote, consensual validation, i.e. people coming up to a, a consensus or a false consensus, uh, possibly a false consciousness, uh, of a view of that particular phenomenon, and uh, that 
if allowed to communicate this with each other, unless uh, care was taken, preconceptions could be reinforced rather than gotten rid of. Uh, the other So at this point, the, the question is that uh, these quote-unquote clinici or clinicians uh, are forced to work uh, in environments that are quote simply not conducive to the breaking out of these. Or I guess that's not a quote, but ba basically that you're if you're working in one of these you know psych wards, um, the work environment itself is keeping you from not seeing or from keeping you from seeing that there is no correlation. And that if you are a normal person and you are placed inside of these cycloids, that you will actually see, you will perceive these tests to be accurate, and you will see the correlations there, even if they are not there. And this is not, again, just limited to this test, but any test where you are dealing with this kind of correlation, or, or rather where you are dealing with a set of symptoms and a set of, I guess, observables related to those symptoms and you will ne not necessarily notice if the two are completely uncoupled. If the environment is similar enough to this setup. Now, up until 1967, uh, the, or the explanation for this was that, uh, particularly from experimental psychologists, viewed clinicians as, quote, inferior as scientists as they are unresponsive to evidence, unquote. Uh, but this study shows uh, that this isn't necessarily a failing of individual people or personal defects, but this is actually something, th this is how human beings, normal human beings, or at least as evidenced by undergraduate psych students, uh, which may or may not be normal human beings, but regardless, uh, the, you know, as normal as they were capable of measuring, uh, people still had this problem, and it was the same problem. It was the same clumps, it was the same preconceptions. And so the, the issue is not necessarily the people. It is the system and the way of dealing with uh, this kind of, or the, the, the way of dealing with correlations themselves in a clinical environment. So, we're going to, you know, th th this is where things kind of get summarized a little bit. So, we, we, we've gone all the way through all these kind of fine details of why they think, uh, you know, that there is a, you know, why there's not uh, the ability, or why we are not, um, not, not seeing correlation. What, you know, a, a lot of reasons that could have caused this but didn't. Uh, and so, the, the, you know, how, how do we prevent this? If you're, you know, going back to 1967, or if you're going into the psych, you know, nursing field now, um, I don't know if there's still, if this issue is still present, but I probably put you know, some money that uh, this sort of thing hasn't completely gone away. But I, I guess I could be surprised. I'm not in the field myself, so the the, the question of, you know, what do you do about this? Situation? So the first thing that they suggest is to actually go out and do the study. And if you're interested in working in the psych um, field uh, or in clinical psychology in general, to actually go out and do this as a lab. And so you can see firsthand how wrong people get this and how bad uh, this consensual validation cycle is. Uh, there may be other consensual, or consensual validation cycles uh, that you can observe to get the same kind of effect. Um, I'm sure Facebook is probably among the places to go you know, fishing for this sort of thing. Um, and it would be probably pretty fun to put together a, a meme for Facebook that exemplified this. Uh, but you really have to see it to believe it. Uh, at least if you're going into the field and are going to be the type of person who would actually have this problem. So if you if you see it, you'll you'll at least know you'll be a little bit more self-conscious about uh, these sorts of finding correlations 
Um, and uh, of course, there is the uh, XKCD, you know, correlation, not causation comic. Uh, that's probably very relevant here, which I may try to link in the comments. But the the other uh, suggestion, other than actually going through and doing this study, uh, is that the uh, I guess quote uh, such training, however, would not solve the more basic problem that the clinician's uh, cognitive task often or apparently exceeds the capacity of the human intellect. Unquote. That alone, right there, is more, probably one of the most powerful things you're, you're likely to read to you know, here today. Uh, in that they're, they're saying right off that no matter how smart you are, no matter how talented of a psych nurse you are, uh, if you're put in, in, into this environment, and if you're put into this particular experiment, you're going to probably fail it. And you're going to fail it in a predictable way and that your intellect itself is actually flawed and that it's not even that we don't know how to, to remove spurious correlations we just as human beings don't and so by the 1960s and by the time that this paper was you know being put out uh, they were already thinking about taking people out of the room and to take the evidence out and have someone, you know, some kind of a, a beam counter, or perhaps a literal, you know, quote unquote computer, i.e., you know, a woman, because it was one women at the time, you know, actually go through, do the math without prejudice of what they were, or what math they were doing, and, you know, actually find if there were correlations or not. Um, and so th this is all before electronic computers were even really conceivable as a means of solving this particular problem, uh, they had already noticed that the psych nurses themselves were at the end of what's possible, in the end of human potential, as far as seeing things that are not there, not seeing things that are there, and in particular, not seeing trends that are not present properly. And so, I guess in summary, uh, you know, don't look down on these poor psych nurses for not being able to do this. It's not necessarily that there's something wrong with them. It's something wrong with being human. And human beings are just not smart enough to be psych nurses. And working in a psych, I guess, clinic, uh, or a psych lab, you're going to run into this problem. So, that was... ideas 50 years in each video hope you enjoyed it uh, again I'm not a professional you know psych nurse myself uh, I have you know, fairly little access to that entire world so if this has changed in the past 50 years you know definitely make it make a post or a comment to that effect I'm interested to see if this sort of thing has improved and if there's been progress made in this kind of area uh, and if there's you know, any mistakes, I, I think that hopefully I've summarized things correctly, but if for whatever reason I, I made an oversight, um, feel free to correct me. Uh, and again, if, if there's anything about this study or uh, how to replicate it that you're curious or, or would like suggestions on how to do, uh, definitely leave a, a comment in the uh, whatever thread this video is posted in. Uh, this is hopefully, this series is hopefully a learning experience for all of us. And uh, hopefully you enjoy it and get some value from it. And uh, again, uh, don't uh, kind of beat yourself up if you're uh, in, in a uh, psych lab or a, a psych ward and uh, you're feeling overwhelmed by your inability to uh, deal with this because, hey, you're just human, right?